The photographs you have just seen are the creation of India's foremost photographer, Raghu Rai. And we were lucky enough to have him come to our studio for a lengthy conversation. Raghu Rai, thank you for being with us. And hopefully you're going to take us into that magical world of photography and how it happens and why it happens. And first and foremost, I would like to know, how did you become a photographer? Accidents happen in anybody's life. So this was one of those accidents, you know, which eventually gave my direction. Not that I ever thought of becoming a photographer. It's just that I came to stay with my elder brother, S. Paul, who was taking pictures for the last so many years. And I was not doing anything at that time. So just for fun's sake, one day I asked my brother, I said, give me a camera, I'll also go and take some pictures. So whatever pictures I took the first time, one of the photographs was sent to the Times newspaper, London, and they printed half-page picture with my name. So we thought, very good deal. <laughs> this is how I started. This is how you started? Yeah. And why did you like <coughs> Why did you s decide to continue? Yes, very interesting point, because, you see, I have been fond of nature and life from the very beginning, from my childhood. but. The camera, the instrument, when I have it in my hands, the greatest thing that happened to me was, apart from the fact that my picture got published in such an important place, that when I put that camera on my eye and I start looking at the world, my energies are concentrated and I look at the world with greater intensity and sensitivity and exploration. And when you start exploring the world, when you start exploring the world, that's where your journey begins. <laughs> that's fascinating. You mean it's easier for you to explore the world when you have a camera than yeah. without it? Yes. And also, I, sometimes I find it sinful if I have to witness a great event and I'm not carrying a camera. <laughs> Why is it sinful, actually? Tell me. Because being a photographer, if I can't capture that great moment, I've got no right to watch it. <laughs> it's a missed, okay, it's a, and, and it's a missed opportunity to yes, yes. touch others through it also? Well, of course, it, it has to be two-way communication, you know. Right. But yeah. when, when you grew up, photography was not there at all? No, never. You see, it was just one of those things, you know, which fascinated me. And then the interest grew, you know, richer. So, you know, but also, you know, when you're young, you know, you don't know exactly what you are exploring and you go on searching and exploring you know and then gradually you get start getting the clarity about life about nature about what the world means to you so you in your context you start seeing the world you know the reality around you do you also get clarity about why you are here on this planet and absolutely, what is your purpose absolutely through that <laughs> yes you see the, that kind of interaction and close encounters with life make you aware of your own self as well. So your purpose in this world becomes clearer and easier. Mm -hmm. you know, who you are and why, why are you doing this? You know? So why are you doing this? How, how would you define it? The, the you see, uh, it's very simple. Now I can say it very simply. You see, we have a beautiful wor word in Hindi called darshan. Photograph is like seeing and darshan is seeing and experiencing in totality. So you see a physical situation and you see the most emotions and motions and energy and feeling and when you start interacting with that energy with those emotions and that is where your total seeing becomes a darshan. So, for me, photography, through photography, life is a darshan. And with, I'm lucky enough to capture it also for myself. So that darshan has an evidence. And this is how you grow. When darshan becomes richer and larger, you become a richer human being, you know. Right. 
What about um, the, in terms of the purpose of all of that, also about touching others, what it can do to others' lives, in terms of their own darshan? Well, uh, it's very simple that when you respond to situations, first of all, you have to be like a clean mirror who can reflect everything. To be clean mirror, you have to be instinctive and responsive. So anything, when you respond to anything from instinct, means you've responded to the energies, the current of this, the place. And that current, when you capture, it stays alive for itself. And when you share it with others, that current touches others also. It's very simple. From but is it possible to be a clean mirror? Because wherever we go, we do have our past, baggage, our personality, sure. our baggage. Yeah. Or if I look at something extremely sad, I'm going to be very emotional maybe. Let's say when you sure. went to Bhopal yeah, and things like that. So how can you be a completely clean mirror? As and when you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is precisely the discipline you create over the years, you know. And you learn to be, when you make yourself available mentally, physically, spiritually, like a clean mirror. And then whatever you portray has the magic. You know, it lives for itself. Okay. So basically it's almost like a meditation. You have to prepare yourself, be centered and be uh, that clean mirror. And then you can connect with the energy. <coughs> yeah. You see, if you ask me to meditate, I cannot. And uh, sometimes I have tried, you know, in different places, you know, spiritual places, but I get nowhere. But when it comes to taking pictures and, you know, you go on and on and on and connect with everything around you, and that's the time when the meditative moment happens. So this is through our medium, through our discipline, that we achieve that moment of meditation when that whatever you capture holds it together. You know. Right. Now, one thing which is very important for you, and I know you've said it over and over again, that Raghurai's eye is no eye. You don't want to impact and transform the reality that you're photographing. You want it to be as neutral as possible. Absolutely. So tell me more about that. You see, in my early days, you know, of course, I wanted my images to have that drama, that strength, that structure, that composition, you know, so that people look at it and they say, wow, what a great image. And then, you know, while doing this kind of dealing with physical elements and creating a structure or a composition, capturing, not creating, capturing a kind of composition and a structure. Now, each individual has one's own sense of balance and structural kind of compositions which live inside us, which we go on repeating unconsciously at times. So the purpose in creativity is to go beyond those structural compositions and capture something for itself that you know finally it's not your structure it's the structure created by different elements of life which come and disappear but in that moment it has become tangible because of the meditative kind of energy that you invested into it you know and that's when magic happens that's when, when all of that happens, all of that actually. is aligned Absolutely. Because you see the only difference is India is most amazing country for any photographer, Indians or foreigners who come to India, they are mesmerized by India. What a country, what a country. And same goes for me. I tell you, even today after 40 years in photography, I say, what a country of mine. Oh my God, I'm mm. breathless. You know? It's endless. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. But you see, you could be physically attracted to things so quickly that the inner energies and inner strength of a place, you know, it's not so easy to respond to, you know. And that's where, you know, you have to penetrate and be silent. You know, unless you have the silence inside you, that you are not looking for a great image, you are not a great creator, you are not a guy with a structure in your mind. So, you see, purity of things is very important. Right. That, you know, I captured a moment from daily life. It should be such a kind of slice of life that if I have to give it back to life again, that life starts moving without any disturbance.
rather than the structured photograph that I did. You know, finally you put it back and that structure creates its own kind of jerks like that. I don't know if it's making any no, sense. It, it, it's making total sense. Yeah. Now, I know that quantum mechanics talks about other things and how the second we look at something, it actually transforms that thing. So I guess it's an ideal that you're striving for. I guess it's not pos possible completely to, to achieve that, but you can try. You see, also what happens in our country, many of our own photographers and Western photographers also, they are so fascinated by such varied uh, things happening in this country that it's basically a physical play of things you know we end up capturing and with wisdom and with clarity and the discipline of the medium you've taken a frame looks very good but you know it unless it has that special emotive you know kind of connection and current to live for itself because you see, great elements, great situations are great by themselves. So what is your contribution? The current, you know, that energy. Yeah. That's where you have the connectivity. And those who see it, they also will get that connectivity going, you know. So the response will be equally warm, you know. Yes, I understand. And at the same time, you're saying it's not an ego thing. It's not about me trying to have this yeah. amazing photograph. That is very and it's important. a ragu right photograph. No, because photograph. me, this yeah. guy, yeah. is the only guy who comes in my way when I take pictures. So I, sometimes I just demolish him, you know, brush him aside, and I say, let me walk straight. <laughs> right, because some people, I think, come to you and say, oh, I recognize this is a photograph of yours, and then actually you don't like it so much. You'd yeah. like people not to be able to recognize that Naturally, it's a ragu rai. Yes. Photograph. Because you know also, you see, this kind of stamp means that you have com become static with your stamp. Stamp is a permanent thing and life and nature are always on the move. So you have to take a very clean, clear decision who you want to be. To be known with a stamp? No, not me. Also, if you're known with a stamp, it's like you're in a frame Yeah. and then you're not free no, anymore. No, I'll put it the other way. Yeah. That I have done a photograph, a frame, which is very good. People say, wonderful, Raghura, you've done a great frame. And I'm so thrilled and happy that I become a prisoner in that frame. And I go on repeating it again and again in different physical realities. So it's a dangerous game you're playing with yourself. Eventually, eventually, the idea is to liberate yourself from every emotion, every feeling that you get entangled with you know. And be completely fresh and com completely Absolutely. clean in that yeah. moment. You live through it yeah. and come out as a clean man. Walk through it and come out as a pure soul. Now, I know that many people would be fascinated to know a little bit more technically how you do those things. For instance, when you, you go somewhere, do you take hundreds and thousands of photo photographs and then destroy almost all of them to keep one? that will capture the essence or how, how do you go through all of that? What is the <coughs> process? No, I'll say bulk of it that we click. I'll say 90% of it is either repetitive or rubbish, more than that. And, uh, but also, you know, it varies. In sometimes you walk into a situation, you have no time to even think, you know, or look at it again you just click the image you know situation and you've got a great image going and other times you know you're going on walking around with the camera clicking away and you haven't reached anywhere <laughs> so you know you can't define it really but do you know it the moment you feel you have captured the essence of a place or of a face or something or an event do you know this is it i've, I've got it now or is it afterwards no you see you no, no, it's not like that okay when you are one with the situation yeah. and that energy has crisscrossed us. That connection. That connection has happened. It has touched you deep inside. And there is a kind of uh, that feel, you know, that gives you kind of goosebumps. You know. <laughs> it has happened, you know. So, so, you know. So, so because it's all about this energy and this connect, uh, then technology and all those evolutions of photography have not uh, made a big impact on you or has it? To begin with, you know, 
to be technically good and aware of your equipment is very important, essential. Now, I am a man with 40 years in photography, so I'm talking from that plane. But to have enough knowledge, technical knowledge and controls, one thing is the discipline of the medium. Hmm? Second thing is your creative abilities to connect and capture. So together they should work. But I'll still I'll say whether you have a great camera or fairly okay camera, it's the timing and the ability to do it at the right time that matters. And sometimes even if your quality is not good or you didn't have time to change your you know kind of settings you know and it's underexposed or overexposed it doesn't matter because that magical moment has its own power to stay alive you know. yeah if the connect is there the connect yeah, is there absolutely if it's underexposed Good quality, not bad quality yeah. then nobody bothers you know it's fun i understand mm -hmm. now what about uh, photography in india is it uh, the contemporary photography in india how do you look at it and the evolution well, now in last five, six years, there have been many photographers, young photographers taking pictures. A lot more is happening and many more galleries have started showing photographs. So there is a lot of movement, you know. Yeah, because when you started, <coughs> it was really not the case. Yeah, very few people. And we also in our early years in 70s and 80s, we, we really didn't know where exactly to go. And you see also the foreign magazines were banned. We couldn't get the kind of equipment we wanted. Today, you can go on internet and see anybody's work, you know, who's doing what in which part of the world. And you have access to any kind of equipment, you know, which has made a lot of difference. But it's a very transitional period in India because many photographers are doing all kinds of experiments. Experiments which are part of the programming and influence they, they have from the Western masters. The biggest problem in photography is that, no, I'll say bulk of us, most of us, most of the time we are programmed human machines. Now, when we start taking photographs, we have seen many photographs, many images which are stored in this computer. And youngsters, when they go out and how they recognize it's a good picture, they see almost similar kind of situation which they've seen before, which is programmed here. And this, yes, they take a picture. If any young photographer will ask me, can you give us one point that can make a difference to my life as a photographer, I'll say, please don't take all those good pictures which are stored here. And that's when you will start looking for something original and you shall find it. Because nature has, you know, so many gifts. It's endless. Everywhere, you know. So you can always Absolutely. find something new if Absolutely. you want to. But unfortunately, most of us, most of the time, we reproduce. And this is what is happening in today's photography, that bulk of them, they think, you know, that maybe it's not done in India, but if it's done in Europe or America or elsewhere, it, it means the same to me, you know, because in creativity, there are no boundaries defined, you know. Globalization has come to India now, but art lives in, on global level. You know. it, it survives on global level, you know and freshness of energy and uh, sort of concepts and the way you capture things. You know. We'll continue to talk about issues related to modernity in India. We'll just take a short break and we'll be just back. भारतीय बैडमिंटन को विश्व स्तर तक ले जाने में मैं एक जरिया बनी आज दुनिया भर के खिलाड़ियों के लिए हम भी एक चुनौती हैं इस पर मुझे गर्व है भारत मेरी पहचान वेलकम बैक टू एवरीबॉडी वी आर इन अ कन्वर्सेशन विद फोटोग्राफर रघु राय सो वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द इन्फ्लुएंस ऑफ फॉर आई मीन फॉरेन फोटोग्राफी एंड मॉडर्निटी इन इंडिया 
tell us more about, actually you've been a witness of India and how is that it, it has evolved in the last 40 years. So you have taken a lot of photographs, for instance, of moles of the emerging middle class and so on and so forth. What is your feeling about the changes today in India? No, the changes are inevitable, you know, especially after globalization, the effects are so very strong. And especially for a photographer, they are physically so visible, <laughs> you know, that you can't avoid them. And in any case, that's the way things are changing around us. So we've got to respond to that also, you know. And uh, which, is, which is interesting for us, but I will say bulk of it is what we photograph today is has all it's basically on physical level a lot of physicality and a lot, lot of uh, superfluous stuff that is floating around in our space in terms of elements in terms of forms and textures and colors which are you know very western and uh, but the fact remains that india is so huge and so ancient and s it's you know inner current is so powerful that uh, you know these th effects of globalization are only in these big metro cities you know which are you know, going through these changes so bulk of india still manages to live i see know, its own kind of energy you know and depth which which has its connection of centuries and centuries of civilization you know so this connection to the roots is still there you feel yeah, absolutely, it absolutely absolutely you're not pessimistic about that disappearing no, you see, before that disappears, we would have disappeared from this planet, you know. And, uh, you know, the purpose is not to worry, you know, the purpose is to record and understand it and share it with others. See, if we had to define Indian photography then, what would you say? Indian photography, the Indianness hasn't arrived yet. You know, we have a few very good photographers. As I said, bulk of our photography is inf influenced by the Western photographers, which is very unfortunate. And in any case, you know, we've seen it in last few decades, you know, how fashions, styles and trends come to Europe and America. And when they uh, start becoming obsolete there, they start disappearing from there, start coming to India. So similar cases uh, with photography, which is very unfortunate. And that's why I emphasize on the fact that for God's sake, don't take all those good pictures which are stored here. Because we cannot be a second rate portrait of somebody else, you know. And uh, unless you watch your steps, even, I mean, it works, you know, like Western influence is one thing. Second, as I said earlier, your own prison frame that you create you know people have said wah wah about it and you start repeating your own frame so creativity lives beyond wisdom beyond knowledge and even beyond philosophies philosophies are born later on first it's a moment of realization and experience that you go through instinctively and that you capture the wisdom the philosophies have no meaning for me because they eventually what you've experienced when you put it into words it becomes your wisdom or your philosophy so that's a second hand knowledge for me you know there is so much to explore you see there are thousands of photographers in this country there are th so many great musicians in this country so many painters so many writers you think they've consumed everything you think they have nothing left for us the only thing you know why nothing is left most people is the fact that they come from here and not from here and they haven't uh, kind of developed a kind of expression and a journey of explorations you see it's all about explorations when you explore the world new things come up and you grow and you grow richer and next time you grow deeper also and that exploration is where there i can draw a line between man and animal men have heart and feeling human beings and they explore animals don't so you go on repeating the stuff which is stored here 
and that is the most in fact it happens in more so in photography because <coughs> you literally repeat if a young painter is say uh, copying Picasso but his hand does not have the discipline. So, he will go on doing it, but he will still do it somehow his way because he does not have enough control over things, but we can literally copy which is dangerous. And what do you think about people who take a photography and of course with all the digital world everything can be on the computer retouched? You see those who were honest then they will remain honest today. Those who were using a knife to kill somebody and those who were using a knife like a good surgeon depends you know. If you were a cheat then you will cheat now. But let me tell you there was one photographer from America Jerry Elsman and he used to mix three four negatives to make one photograph. That is what we are talking about you know Photoshop you, you exactly. mean to say the Photoshop exactly. that you can do and how you can change the image exactly. and that guy mixed three four negatives in 70s and 80s and 60s you know and you should see the dreams he created so powerful so wonderful and the quality with which he did I mean as perfect or better than the Photoshop you can do. So fine use Photoshop but for God's sake create something unique which has never been seen before. before. But you know just you know struggling with stupid stuff and reaching nowhere has no meaning. And what about mm. the evolution of fashion photography, photojournalism, all the, there are many different kinds of photography actually. How do you see that today in India? You know very bad you know it is very <laughs> unfortunate I have to repeat myself that bulk of it even fashion photography our photographers they copy the western masters and they almost repeat the same picture here in, in, in context. As far as photojournalism is concerned look at our top magazines and uh, top newspapers. I do not see any immediacy and power in an image that captures the news today. It is all very easy infotainment kind of stuff you know somebody who's coined this word should be shot you know infotainment you know what rubbish you know. So that is what most newspapers and magazines this is what photojournalism has been reduced to and in any case those magazines and those newspapers were committed to the cause of ordinary people those that era has gone you know it does not exist anymore we are here in big cities to serve the big guys and that is what photojournalism is all about and that is what fashion and industry and everything else is you know make very pretty nice loving and let me tell you it is become far more easier in digital technology today than uh, working on a film and uh, with the photoshop you could do anything. You know. So everybody is engaged in happy snappy infotainment lovely stuff you know which looks good and I have seen you know editors also they feel very good lovely picture because it is so colourful and so interesting you know. <laughs> so this is happening to photojournalism because the magazines are asking it so the responsibility is more with the no both ways it both works ways. both ways because if you are not an explorer. Now you see I have heard this line from many some young photographers saying that array sahab I have taken this good picture but my editor won't print it. So you give up exploring the world you see the difference is when you go out and start exploring political social cultural any situation and when you are on a journey of exploration your mind spirit energy are all invested into it and what you capture is it has all that that you have invested in a situation. So when you come back to your office and you have to share it with your editors or whosoever you are not alone you are charged with that energy that you have captured. So if you do not invest it and capture it that way and come back with the same power to share and have that understanding with your editors it does not work that way. It is also, it's also the responsibility of that person Yeah, that to person do that. to begin with to go on and have those kind of battles with your editorial uh, bosses you know. Right. <laughs> that is what we did you know till the last day.
And you found out all of that on your own, or did you have mentors and people who guided no, you? No, no. That's, that's what, this is what, uh, you know, this is what I say that today we can share all this with young photographers. When we were doing it, we were fighting our own battles, you know. We didn't even know the direction we needed to take, you know. So you definitely had to explore <laughs> uncharted territories. Absolutely. And that was the greatest fun. But, you know, really it gave you so much inner strength and power to deal with anybody and everybody, which was so good. Yeah, it helped build yourself, yeah, the real yeah, self of who you are. Yeah. I will just take a short break and we'll be just back. Especially when I'm out playing in the foreign land and they say Sanya Mirza from India, it makes me feel very proud. I am an Indian first. Welcome back to all of you uh, and thank you for being with us. We are in conversation with photographer Raghu Rai. Uh, now what about inner change and personal change? I know that actually you've explored a lot also inside and a few people have influenced you a lot and I would like you to maybe share some of those things. Um, the first actually it's Mother Teresa. That's right. Can you tell <coughs> us a little bit about that? You see the other day mm, the debate was that uh, the Albanians have claimed the remains of mother. You know after a hundred years Albanians have woken up. You know why? Because she was a Nobel laureate. If she wasn't, maybe they, they won't have made this claim. On the other hand, she was my mother. How can I give away the remains of my mother? Come on. Whether she was a Nobel laureate or not is the second thing. She was Bharat Ratna also. And let me tell you, this can happen only in India, you know, that she was given Bharat Ratna way back in. Uh, I think of 1980s or something like that. And when she passed away, a Christian woman comes from Albania to India and she starts doing this seva, this service to the ordinary people. She says, when Christ was suffering, I was not there to nurse him. So all these people who are suffering, they are like Christ to me. And she used to say, I'm not a social worker and I'm serving him when I nurse these poor people who are suffering. So see that kind of energy and magic she had you know, and connection she had with people and people also loved her in return with equal kind of intensity and when she passed away it was raining for two days her body was kept in the state in Calcutta and thousands of people you know two kilometers long queues waiting to go in and take a last look at her. This can happen only in India. And she was our mother. So how can you give away the remains? But certainly, you know, I have done book on Mother Teresa. First one book I did in 1970, second was I think in 82 and then again, um, no, the 88. And then uh, the last book I did, did was about four years ago. Why? Because she was one of those rare human beings that who touched our life so deeply and to such tremendous details that the mother, you see, I started photographing her when she was hardly known, 1970. And the mother who left us the other day was the same ordinary, simple, loving human being. It didn't matter whether she was a Bharat Prat or Nobel she Prize. A, doesn't matter, didn't matter and she never fluctuated as a human being. So that was the magic power, you know, and the purity and the connectivity she had with people and with him. It was, you could always see this in her eyes. And, and that's what I loved photographing about her, you know. And then it's easier for you to <coughs> connect with him also when you are in the presence of someone like Absolutely. her. Absolutely. Then you, well, at least you can say that, yeah, he exists. He exists. Know? At least I have a proof now. <laughs> Yes, because that time, you see, two things. When people, two people are in love and they are sitting together, they look very beautiful. 
and more beautiful is the expression when you are connected with him and you are in love with him and that's the supreme kind of connection you know that you can have so these are the two two most beautiful things in this world you can see about human beings you know and so do you have that that connection with him do of you have course. it as often as possible <laughs> no it's not so simple not me i'm not so <laughs> but i guess you know the difference is that i don't think he's there and he's going to come down and meet us as such as i said darshan life is a darshan and when you go on having it it fulfills you and connects you with the supreme energy and that's where my darshan lies you know through people and also my faith lies in the eyes of other people when i see them connected to one another and to him and when i capture that that is my faith and fulfillment and then you touch the divine yeah that's how through them you can touch the divine like guru takes you connects you to the lord to the supreme energy yeah what about the guru and the role of the guru in your life well our guru ji was so amazing you know that he could you know sitting in his room he could see you know that okay raghura is sitting in an interview and tell him you know after he finishes it he, he should meet us you know he was he had that kind of abilities he could change your path you know and he had changed so many people's lives can you tell us a couple of words about him and well, his name basically he he didn't want his name to be taken by anybody but his name was nirmal guru ji and he was from punjab and when he'll walk into the place where all the sangat everybody was sitting you'll get his fragrance when he's not there physically with us whenever he connects with us we get that fragrance of guru ji even today if i want to become a scientist i spend years you know learning about science or a photographer you know go on shooting and or painter or a writer you know you go on painting for years and you know then you practice and you start doing something good but here we are talking about connecting with the supreme energy which is from here to there and there is no instrument in between a camera or a brush or a pen or anything else and one of the ways of approaching all of that is music also isn't it music is one of the most direct of the art forms i'll say because it you see you don't hear it from here you hear it from here and when it touches you deep down but again depends on the musician also because bulk of the music being created today is you know very um, colorful and very attractive kind you know which is melodious and uh, the spiritual the classical music which is again which is you know you get those moments of you know supreme energy playing through you like you know ali akbar khan sahab would say that i start playing on sarood after a while sarood starts playing on me and i don't know where it takes me you know this is beautiful absolutely actually i know you spent some time with him yeah you were blessed enough yeah and uh, i think we should watch uh, uh, listen some of his music yes of course let's do it he was that. one of uh, not one of he was greatest musicians of india you know, and the world you know. and the world acknowledged it that he was a great maestro you know right let's let's look yeah. at and listen
It's amazing. It's mm. amazing. <laughs> This is the power of, of music. One more thing I, I wanted to ask you, because music, it's still a noise. And I know that you like talking about silence. Some people say one photograph <coughs> is so powerful, it's more than a thousand words. But a thousand words, it's very noisy. Yes. And <laughs> silence Actually. is very important. Yeah. You see, these are cliches in any art form. A, a good picture is worth a thousand words. A thousand words can be a lot of bloody noise, you know. Who wants to listen to a thousand words? Because for me, when I see a great movie or listen to a great piece of music or see a great piece of art, you know, it should restore silence in you. You have no questions, you have no answer, you are not waiting for anything. It has restored silence in you. Peace. It has, it has restored you to yourself. And that's the most amazing thing art can do and music can do, to restore you to yourself. What does a great guru do? He does that, just that, restores you to yourself. So th this is what you experience with Guruji? Yeah, Guruji, and with great music, with great works of art, you know. And the right energy also. I know there was this very nice story you told one day. You, you went uh, to Mexico, to Oaxaca, yeah. and you met a woman who could move across, across. on the table <laughs> without touching it? No, or she touching it? it? Or how, how was it? You no, know, it was about three feet high cross, very old cross, you know. You could see the grains of the wood, you know, and everything. You could make out it's a very old cross. So what she'll do, she'll put it on the table and she'll just touch it and it will go on moving like that. And so, you know, I said, can I try? She says, yes, try. I tried, it fell down. So I thought to myself, I said, wait a minute. In photography, that, you know, something that I have learned is that this, this space between you and the subject has to be, is very holy, very precious. If you understand that and you take your steps, no less and no more than required. And that happens when you are in unison with the elements around you. You are in total connectivity that each step you take and where you stop is not less, a step less or a step more. So I said, wait a minute, here maybe I pushed it too hard and it fell down. So I just touched it, just the right kind of touch and it moved. So I gave another touch and it went on. So it was not moving because it was carrying Christ's energy. It's you, the Christ. You have to create that energy in connection with the Christ. That's such a beautiful metaphor. Life yeah. should be like that all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's so hard though. <laughs> we keep no, forgetting and then we're dragged into no, this it's, reality it's, again. It's a delicate, sensitive balance in those moments, you know, that you have to understand. And then it flows. And you flow with it. <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah. And one last story, if you don't mind telling it, of the Buddha, of the people who were uh, waiting yeah. for the Buddha to come <laughs> and they were noisy and yeah, talking. Can, you, can you tell it? The story goes, you know, that when Buddha got his enlightenment and um, he was, you know, going from one place to another, to another small town, to another village, meeting people, talking to people. So they were you know, he was to reach one place, you know, where, you know, th all those villagers were waiting for him, that Buddha is coming. So he got delayed, you know. And, uh, you know, what happens, you know, the crowds which are sitting there, they start talking to each other, you know. So there was so much noise, you know, everybody was talking and uh, still there was no sight of Buddha, you know. And then suddenly Buddha arrives, they say, and there was that platform where he was to sit. And he comes and sits down quietly. And when people start noticing him, they start stop talking and the silence starts traveling all over. So all that noise, all those people who were talking, you know, suddenly it has converted into total silence and everybody is looking at him and watching in silence. And Buddha, magical as he was, and Buddhism as magical it can be, you know, that he did not speak a word, word, you know. He looked at everyone with loving eyes and he watched and very lovingly he watched and everybody was silent. 
and he restored the silence and he got up he thanked them and went and then he went he had done his what he had to do Absolutely. he had restored the peace the yeah. inner peace yeah. but uh, actually one question that begs to be asked is that if there is complete peace mm. and complete silence right i may be tempted to actually not even create anymore or not move anymore uh, what what drives you what still continues to drive you in new projects and new books <laughs> and new <foot> <laughs> exhibitions and i wish you know this kind of bliss can last forever we human beings are very wicked people you know? the lives we the years we've lived you know the previous years you know and decades you know we are a product of all those years of experience you know and this kind of bliss comes and disappears otherwise i would have been a great saint by now i promise you <laughs> so this is because my explorations in this this world are not complete yet so i will never achieve that ultimate silence you know i see but that's good for us because thank <laughs> god <laughs> thanks to that we I can be know. still touched by your <laughs> photography no you so. see uh, th about music you see these great musicians like kishori amon karji ali akbar khan saab uh, pandit bhim sen joshi you know these people with their tapasya and their you know practice and meditative experience they take you to a higher plane you know and really when i go to listen to these great masters i sit like a little disciple you know that he will take me i remember you know once kishori ji got very angry with the crowd because the way they were sitting so i felt very fluttered i said she sings so beautifully and she connects you to him and why she is being so rough you know so one of our friend who had organized uh, the concert he took me to meet her after the concert so she said oh raghubai i'm sorry you know i get very uneasy when i see uneasy movements i said kishori shall i tell you something you said once that when i sing my audience i treat my audience like my god that they are my god so i am singing to them i said i promise you when i come to listen to great musicians like you i think you are my god because you are going to take me there i said you know what happened you were angry with your god my god was angry with me so where did we reach we didn't reach anywhere <laughs> so it's you know that kind of connectivity which is balanced on a very sensitive edge you know which you cannot ruffle you know i know it's extremely fragile F very fragile But and that's where creativity lives not in knowledge no not in wisdom not in philosophies on that fragile level well wishing you and wishing all of us more and more of it thank you raghurai so much for being with us and sharing thank all that magic thank you thank you